Ginny Weasley is a character that was literally destroyed by the film adaptation. Of course, many Harry Potter characters differ in the films and books, but Ginny's portrayal suffered more than others. She was criminally neglected and her character was completely rewritten, turning her into someone entirely different. Let's try to understand what exactly the adaptation did to the character. Enjoy the analysis. Difference number one. A secondary character. Upon reflection, I came to a fairly obvious conclusion. Ginny Weasley is a deeply secondary character, not just in the films, where she is literally part of the crowd in many scenes, but in the books as well. For instance, in The Prisoner of Azkaban, Ginny's name is mentioned only 17 times, and there are barely any memorable scenes featuring her. In this regard, the adaptation was more than faithful to the source material. Of course, Ginny is given more attention in the books. That's logical. But as in the movies, up to the Order of the Phoenix, she just exists. Ginny is mentioned periodically in the text, occasionally says or does something, but no one pays much special attention to her. It's only from the fifth book that Rowling begins to gradually bring her character out of the shadows. A similar situation occurs in the films, as the Order of the Phoenix subtly highlights Ginny a few times. By the Half-Blood Prince, she appears on screen more than in all the previous Harry Potter parts combined. If you think about it, her screen time is indeed directly proportional to her presence in the pages of the books. It seems like a maximally honest adaptation that should satisfy everyone. But, as usual, difference number two, it's the little things. As we've already discovered, in the early parts of Harry Potter, whether in films or books, Ginny was criminally overlooked. Essentially, her role was reduced to that of an ordinary extra. However, even the rare appearances of Ginny in the books create a completely different impression. Your opinion of the character is literally formed by the little things. And here lies the main catch, because the films completely ignored this fact, unintentionally stripping the girl of her character. The cinematic Ginny is portrayed as a shy introvert who rarely expresses her emotions and usually stays on the sidelines, interacting only with a close circle of people. But as they say, still waters run deep. And the quiet Ginny can surprise everyone at school with her incredible magical skills or prowess on the Quidditch field. And you know, considering the impact Tom Riddle's diary had on her at the time, clearly a traumatic experience, her shyness and introversion seem appropriate. And in the books, Ginny is honestly just as shy when around Harry, at least for a period of her life. The problem is that over time she overcomes this barrier and completely changes, though it's more accurate to say, opens up. But the films forgot to show this transformation, leaving her character at the level of an 11-12 year old. So who is Ginny Weasley really? She's a smiling and sociable girl who, like many in her family, is incredibly emotional. In the books, phrases like, Ron and Ginny laughed together, Ginny chatted with her friends, Ginny barely held back a laugh, etc., are common. This starkly contrasts with what was shown in the films, where she hardly expresses any emotions except in a couple of scenes, and usually sits quietly on the sidelines. Furthermore, Ron's sister is intelligent, brave, cheerful, and energetic. In other words, think of the idealized version of Hermione from the films. Add a bit of humor, a pinch of Quidditch skills, and you get book Ginny. Quote, Three Dementor attacks in a week, and Romilda Vane only has one question for me. Is it true you have a hippogriff tattooed on your chest? Ron and Hermione burst into laughter. Harry didn't even glance their way. And what did you tell her? That you have a Hungarian horn tail depicted there, Ginny replied, leisurely flipping a newspaper page. Let her think you're a real macho. Thanks a lot, Harry smirked. And what did you award Ron with? A pygmy puff, though I refuse to say where he got it tattooed. Difference number three, emotional range. 
We're used to Ginny Weasley being a shy girl who loses her ability to speak in Harry Potter's presence. The scene from The Chamber of Secrets illustrates this perfectly, but even in the film, Ron explains that Ginny is not usually quiet. And when Potter isn't around, she's completely different. Unfortunately, we never really got to see any confirmation of these words. However, as in the first three books, since Ginny rarely appears apart from the main hero, it's only later, when she matured a bit and began to act naturally even in The Chosen One's company, that the difference between book Ginny and film Ginny became strikingly evident. In The Goblet of Fire, she defends Neville and puts Harry and Ron in their place, hitting where it hurts most. Quote, Don't you dare laugh, Ginny snapped. Hermione appeared in the doorway. Why wasn't anyone at dinner? She asked her friends. Because stop laughing. Because these two were just rejected by the girls they invited to the ball, Ginny explained. Harry and Ron choked with laughter. Well, thanks, Ginny. That's really helpful, Ron said sourly. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. This snippet alone is enough to grasp the entire difference between the two versions of the character, since the film Ginny was never this talkative and emotional. But there's more. For instance, in The Order of the Phoenix, she reacts sharply to being sent away from a meeting. Quote, Excellent, shouted Mrs. Weasley. Excellent, Ginny, bed! Ginny left, but not quietly. The entire time she was ascending the stairs, her indignant complaints were heard, and as she moved down the corridor, Mrs. Black's shrieking yells were added to the noise. Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. Ginny quickly becomes agitated, and can stand up not only to her brother, often nearly coming to blows, but also to her friend Hermione, and even the beloved Potter. If you've read my analysis of Ron, you'll surely remember the scandal Ginny threw after Ronald dared interfere in her personal life, Ginny kissing Dean, to which the film's reaction was restrained. However, it's not all about harshness. Ginny often jokes and does something funny, making her the life of the party, capable of lightening the mood and entertaining those around her. This trait connects her with book Ron. However, some of her antics are more like pranks, amusing some and annoying others. Quote, Au revoir, Ari, said Fleur in a deep voice, kissing him goodbye. Ron also stepped forward, looking at her with hope, but Ginny tripped him and Ron face-planted into the dust at Fleur's feet. Red-faced, furious, and dirty, he hurriedly got into the car without saying goodbye. Harry Potter and the Half-Blue Prince. She's even capable of performing a kamikaze maneuver in front of hundreds of spectators, just to spite a biased, in her opinion, commentator, then calmly state that she simply forgot to stop. Quote, Ginny, where are you going? Harry shouted as the entire team piled on him, preventing him from touching the ground. But Ginny flew past and crashed with a terrible crack into the commentator's platform. Amidst the squeals and laughter of the crowd, the Gryffindor team landed near a pile of planks under which Zacharias weakly struggled. Harry heard Ginny calmly explain to an angry McGonagall, Sorry, Professor, forgot to break. Gasping for laughter, Harry broke free from the other player's grasp and hugged Ginny tightly, then immediately let go. Trying not to look into her eyes, he patted a jubilant Ron on the shoulder. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Difference number four. Significant contribution. Even though Ginny was not as prominently featured as other characters, especially initially, Rowling still tried to make her stand out, to make her significant in the reader's eyes. And judging by how many people are disgruntled with the film version, comparing it to the magnificent book of Guinea, Rowling succeeded, starting with how sharply, like Ron, she reacts to the word mudblood from Kikima's mouth, or defends Hagrid, calling him a wonderful teacher, and ending with her personal contribution to the Chosen One's adventures. For example, it was Ginny who figured out how they could contact Sirius, unlikely that Umbridge would monitor her own fireplace. She also roped in Fred and George, 
who helped distract Dolores. Quote, Well, Ginny said leisurely, breaking off a piece of the egg in turn, if you really want to talk to Sirius, I guess we could arrange it. Forget it, Harry replied gloomily. Umbridge is monitoring all the fireplaces and checking all our mail. If a person has lived their whole life with Fred and George, Ginny mused, he starts to realize that nothing is impossible. It's just about whether you have the courage. Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. And when Harry needed to talk to his godfather again, she personally took care of the distraction so some random student wouldn't notice a daylight break-in. Quote, You can't go there! Ginny loudly told the students crowded in front of the corridor. No, no, sorry. You'll have to take a detour through the revolving staircase. Someone just released choking gas in here. They heard the boys grumble discontentedly. One of them muttered gloomily, I don't see any gas. It's invisible, Ginny replied, convincingly feigning irritation. But if you really want to go ahead, please be my guest. The next idiot who doesn't believe us can be shown your lifeless body. Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. And there are plenty of examples in the books demonstrating the girl's quick wit. Quote, All right, have it your way. It's up to you, Harry said shortly. But if we can't find the other Thestrals, you won't be able to... They'll come, don't worry, Ginny assured him, looking past him like Ron. Why do you think that? Because you and Hermione are covered in blood, just so you know, she explained calmly. And we know that Hagrid attracts Thestrals with raw meat. That's why these two showed up. Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. How formidable Ginny is in battle could be somewhat learned from the films. The books just emphasize it more. So let's talk about her possession instead. Unlike the films, in the books, Ginny hasn't forgotten that she was once controlled by Voldemort. This fact not only helps her bond with Harry, but also allows her to somewhat soothe the Chosen One after Nagini's attack on Mr. Weasley. Quote, We wanted to talk to you, said Ginny, but you keep hiding from us. I don't want people to talk to me, Harry said, growing more and more irritated. Well, that's silly of you, said Ginny. Of the people you know, I'm the only one who knows what it's like to be possessed by you-know-who, and I can tell you about it. Harry froze for a second, stunned by her words. I forgot. Congratulations, Ginny responded coldly. Sorry, said Harry, truly feeling ashamed. So you think, you think I'm possessed? Can you remember everything you've done? Or are there gaps in your memory, times when you don't understand what you're doing? Harry painfully tried to remember. No. Then you know who hasn't taken over you, Ginny stated firmly. When it happened to me, I'd lose memory of what I had done in the preceding hours. I'd find myself somewhere and not know how I got there. Harry was afraid to believe her, but it still made him feel lighter. Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix. In The Half-Blood Prince, Ginny recalls her possession again and draws a parallel between Tom Riddle's diary and the prince's textbook. Quote, Wait a second, said a voice above Harry's left ear, and suddenly he was enveloped in that same scent that had seemed to him in the Slytherin's dungeon. He turned around and saw Ginny. Did I hear right? You're following instructions written in a book by someone unknown, Harry? She was worried and angry. Harry immediately understood what she was thinking. It's nothing, he reassured her, lowering his voice. Not like that time with Riddle's diary. It's just an old textbook with someone's notes. But you're following what's written there. Just tried a few tips written in the margins. Honestly, Ginny, it's nothing. Ginny is right. Hermione immediately became alert. We need to check for any tricks. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Difference number five. Love story. In the books, the relationship between Harry and Ginny developed gradually and consistently. Ginny's feelings were reminded to us practically in every part, and the Chosen One paid a bit more attention to her with each passing year. And what do we have in the films? One short scene from The Chamber of Secrets, vaguely hinting at Ginny's infatuation, Malfoy's prophetic joke, a couple of glances throughout the second part, 
And that's it. The next three films forget about this entirely. Only in The Half-Blood Prince do Harry and Ginny's relationship receive sudden and almost unjustified development. The director tries hard to convince the audience that these two are meant for each other. But it's hard to believe in their love, partly because Harry and Ginny hardly interacted with each other in previous parts. Relationships that should have developed over years progress too rapidly. Not all attempts at romance can be called successful. The shoelace scene or the moment with the cookies are so awkward that they involuntarily remind you of unpleasant, coarse and pervasive sand. Although their perception might have changed for the better if the filmmakers had decided to bring Harry and Ginny closer together a bit earlier, making them at least friends. Not just the friend's sister and the chosen one, which unfortunately did not happen. But how about in the books? First, readers are constantly reminded that Ginny is in love with Harry. Rowling doesn't let us forget this fact. For instance, in The Prisoner of Azkaban, Ron's sister just continues to be bashful. Quote, Ginny always blushed at the sight of Harry. Last year at Hogwarts, he saved her life, and now the girl was even more flustered than before. Hi, she muttered, blushing. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. In The Goblet of Fire, her crush is mentioned directly. Quote, both smiled joyfully at Harry, who smiled back, and Ginny immediately turned crimson. She had been smitten with Harry from the first minute he appeared at the burrow three years ago. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, and in The Order of the Phoenix, following Hermione's advice, Ginny finally pulls herself together, starts interacting normally with Harry, and even dates other guys, hoping to catch the Chosen One's attention. Quote, I never stopped thinking about you, she said. I just couldn't. I was always hoping. Hermione kept telling me I should live my own life, maybe date others, so I could feel more free around you, remember. I couldn't even open my mouth in your presence. She thought that, if I could be myself even a little, you'd pay me more attention. Hermione is smart. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. However, hints aren't everything. For example, on Valentine's Day in the Chamber of Secrets, Ginny most likely sends Harry an anonymous love message. And in The Prisoner of Azkaban, she makes her first awkward attempts to attract the Chosen One's attention herself. Quote, Friends visited Harry, trying to cheer him up. On Saturday evening, Hagrid sent a bunch of yellow flowers resembling cabbage heads. Ginny Weasley, blushing desperately, gave him a homemade get-well card. The card opened itself and sang in a shrill voice, so Harry had to press it down with a fruit vase. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Well, as we know, over the next few years, Ginny uses the time to get closer to the Chosen One. They often talk, the girl finally stops being shy around Harry, and gradually becomes his close friend, always ready to support our main hero. And surprisingly, this bears fruit. Eventually, after breaking up with Cho, whose constant jealousy and tears had annoyed Potter, cheerful, understanding, and simply familiar Ginny turns out to be the perfect match for him. And I can't help but note how different the first kiss scene is. If the shy girl from the films takes Harry to the Room of Requirement, where she practically confesses her feelings in a rather intimate setting, the explosive Ginny from the books kisses Potter in front of the entire house. Moreover, the Chosen One himself takes far more initiative. But I've already talked about this in one of the previous analyses. Quote, We won! Ron roared, appearing right in front of him, waving the cup. We won! 450 to 140! Victory! Harry looked around. Ginny was flying towards him, her face beaming with determination. She wrapped her arms around Harry, and he, without thinking, forgetting that about fifty people were watching, not even realizing what he was doing, kissed her. The living room fell silent. But then someone whistled. Nervous laughter was heard somewhere. Looking over Ginny's head, 
Harry saw Dean Thomas with a cracked glass in his hand and Romilda Vane, who seemed tempted to throw something at him. Hermione was beaming, but Harry's gaze searched for Ron and finally found him. He was still holding the cup, but looked as though he had been hit on the head with a club. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. The Ginny from the books and the Ginny from the films are two absolutely different characters. If the former is vibrant, cheerful, emotional, and simply memorable, the latter is her complete opposite. The shy, silent, and calm Ginny, known to people through the films, unfortunately, has very little in common with her literary prototype. And while many characters are significantly different from Rowling's descriptions, think of Hermione, for example, Ginny Weasley's portrayal was utterly destroyed by these films, without exaggeration or unnecessary drama. If you haven't read the books, you simply don't know who the real Ginny Weasley is. Thank you for watching until this point. I hope this means you found it interesting, and if so, don't forget to like, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe to the channel.